Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Rights. I am Shweta Bandapani, I am the community builder at Be Waste Rights. And uh, in today's panel, we have Adam Reed, who is the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. He is going to be interviewing David Palmer Jones, who's a Group Senior Executive Vice President at Suez Recycling and Recovery. So David was named the winner in uh, Resource Magazine's annual poll of influencers in the waste and resources sector for the year 2020. So we have a pretty exciting uh, conversation where we hear about his journey and what he has to say to uh, people who are just coming in new to the waste and resources sector. And uh, Adam has been a longtime contributor to Be Waste Wise. He's also been, now he's also a longtime moderator at Be Waste Wise. And as David just told me, before the uh, before we start broadcasting the webinar, Adam is like a star of webinars at this point in time. So if you haven't seen uh, any of the webinars he's moderated before, please head to the video panel section of our website and you will find it there. And we received quite a few questions from you all. And uh, we pass them on to both Adam and David and they will be discussing uh, all of your questions in the conversation today. But please feel free to use the Q&A section. Do share more questions that you have because Adam will pick them up and he will pose them to uh, David. So yes, over to you, Adam. That's it from me. <coughs> Sweater, thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. We've got, a, we've got a load of you dialed in, which is fantastic. And I'm sure a few more will, will join us in a moment or two. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I love hosting Be Waste Wise webinars and, and online discussions because we get such a different audience to the ones that, that often dial in from my UK centric um, discussion. So, so that's great. It's also a couple of years since I last did my one-to-one -one interview. Uh, a certain Mike Webster, who was then the Chief Executive Officer of Waste Aid, and who two years ago was voted the uh, Resources Hot 100 number one. So it's almost uh, a circular system as we come back to talk to David Palmer-Jones, who's recently been uh, nominated as that number one for, for 2019, 2020. And of course, Mr. Palmer Jones is my former boss before his recent promotion. So I'll be as nice as I, I can be over the next 55 minutes. It could be a career defining moment for me. Um, but David's somebody I've known for a long time. Um, in passing from, from afar, watching Suez on the journey, and we'll hear a little bit about Suez in the UK and perhaps in Scandinavia as well in the course of this session. Uh, and then as uh, for the last two and a half years as my line manager, which was an interesting uh, introduction to, uh, uh, to senior management and, and life within a very large corporate resource management company. So it's been a journey. I'll share a few anecdotes maybe as we go. I know there's one or two former employees of David's on this webinar, so I'm expecting one or two tricky <laughs> tricky questions to be popped in the box as we go. I'm monitoring those to my left here. So if I, if I look up, that's because I'm checking for another good question to drop into the discussion. So that's enough from me. David, absolute honor to have you here. It's been a while since we've been face to face. This COVID situation is, uh, is stretching all of us working at home. I, I see you, the, uh, the home office is looking quite nice and shiny there. So settled in very well. Are you well today? I am very well, thank you, Adam. It's, it, it, uh, it amuses me that the tables are turned somewhat. It's usually me grilling you. <laughs> now it's you grilling me. It's this, this, I'm, this, I'm up for the challenge. I'm up this is a challenge. 360 performance review. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at the beginning, David. You've been in the sector ooh, longer than me. Tell me, why did you get into waste management? And, and how, how did your career sort of pan out in those early years? It's, it's, a, it's an odd thing. It starts with football at the age of seven. And then it, it um, starts again, this awakening to the industry, when I'm about 22 and a half years old through illness. Right. So I'm going to tell you a few stories that <clears throat> some of them they will be aware of, but there's the second one people won't be aware of. So first is a, as a child. So my dad worked in local government all his life. And he moved around from when he uh, finished uh, University in Edinburgh down to Lincolnshire area. And I was born in Lincoln and he uh, worked in Lincoln. He worked in Doncaster and he moved to Grimsby. So I moved to Grimsby when I was about five years old. I fell in love with football. I was quite a good footballer when I was young. And so my first team was uh, Grimsby Town. So you're talking a long time ago. I'm 57 years old now. So it gives you an idea. It's 50 years ago. That is hard to say that. Uh, and we used to go with my dad to watch the football. And in those days, footballers weren't as well paid, clearly, as they were 
as they are today. And uh, uh, as I say, they used to take a part-time job on the bins, on the dustbins, during the summer, A, to get some money, but also as part of pre-training, would you believe, in order to strengthen themselves. So for someone who was obsessed with Grimsby Town and football, I could go with my dad, any excuse to go to the depot, because then I could meet the people who ultimately during the winter I would be uh, cheering on at Blundell Park, bizarrely in Cleethorpes. It's the only, it's only, football, t- it's the only football team that actually plays in another town. It's very but glamorous. That's a, that's a bit of a... <laughs> so that's where I started. So it wasn't really to do with the industry, but yeah, it's a fascinating business. Fast forward, I go to university, do economics. And so I always wanted to be in advertising when I end up in uh, resources. And so left university, went to work in Leeds, where I come from, really, most of my life in Leeds. And so I joined a, uh, as a marketer into marketing, as a graduate marketeer in terms of a uh, kitchen company, still operating today. And uh, a year or so later, I uh, took a house in Armley in Leeds, for people who know where Armley in Leeds is. It's not the most salubrious place of, uh, of the world. And I took it from somebody who was a missionary in India, in, I think not India, in Africa. And uh, there was a big leak of water. And I ultimately got, um, I picked up a tropical disease, would you believe, from the contents, etc., called paratyphoid. And it wasn't really particularly well diagnosed. So I got very well and I lost my job. So ultimately I got back into work through a temporary job, helping stop privatization of uh, public services uh which is quite funny because i turned turned the other way i could go to gamekeeper discussion and uh, in leeds i got the opportunity to work on lots of different schemes school uh, meals uh crematoriums cemeteries but also in refuse collection street cleansing where they did a massive reorganization where they reduced by almost 70 percent the number of rounds in leeds all to try and fund nursery education and so I was involved in that involved in quite a lot of the advertising and marketing which is a bit of my skill at that point and I moved to St Helens after that point and then in 1989 in February I joined CETA as it was known then uh, on the advice of my mentor from Leeds John Atkinson who now lives in the States who ran part of Westminster, Slough and various other places uh, it was, a, it was a, a big help to me early on. So that's how I got into it, by absolute, by accident or by illness, effectively. And as most people you know, Adam, they don't often, perhaps they do now, because it's such much more of a sexy business now. Uh, I got involved in by, by pure accident, uh, not by design. I, I, I think you're so right. There's, there's so many of us of a certain generation that have you know, fallen into the sector by by misfortune or opportunity, um, but uh, but you're also right. There are so many people now at university studying an environmental degree or post grad, where the waste management, resource management agenda, even the circular economy, perhaps, are now strong modules. And that's not just here in the UK. That's that's globally. I mean, I see it at so many events, and I, and I think for the first time ever, perhaps people are actually choosing to come into this new, sexy, you know, fast paced moving, you know, environment in a way that, you know, perhaps we never did. So what would your advice, you know, you've had a mentor, you've, you've had fortune, you've, you've, you've had a bit of luck probably on the way. What's your advice to those? And I've already had a few questions popped in the box about careers, how, how to, how to get on in life in the, in the, rapidly changing waste and resources sector what's your what's your top tips for those trying to make a career out of this place that we call home yeah it's um as i say you you ride by accident but you you stay forever it's one of those bizarre (laughs) industries so what can i give us a bit of a a bit of advice i feel i'm sort of of a of an age now and statue to be able to give a bit of advice so number one in anything you do you've got to have passion I think that's absolutely number one. For me, it's about having a benefit to the world. I think I would have hated to, to have to go to work and do something that I disagreed with or I didn't feel was um, contributing to society. You've got to remember, you know, you always give better when you are passionate about the subject that you're doing or the job you are. And you're going to spend an awful lot of your personal time uh, actually at work. So much better to have something that you, you, that you love to do than something that's, uh, 
you know, something you don't. Number two on the list would be um, to take some risks. You've got to take risks. You'll be presented throughout your career with some opportunities. Uh, and you always make a, you have to make a decision whether you take those opportunities or take those risks. And sometimes if you want to get on in life, you often have to take uh, those risks and get out of your comfort zone. So for me, going international, I wasn't particularly good at languages at school. So sending myself to France and then Scandinavia to learn two languages, it was a bit of an out of my comfort zone period for me. But it was amazingly rich in reward. But I could have quite easily have not taken that opportunity and then I wouldn't be sitting where I am today. And how, difficult, three, so sorry, how difficult was that, that language skills base? Because coming to it late, you know, if you've not studied that through A-levels or university, then that, that's, you know, a lot of Brits would have gone, whoa, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a tough gig. I did, I did all that. <laughs> <laughs> and I realised when they sent me on an um, intensive course in France, first for two weeks, which my head almost exploded trying to learn French in two weeks, which you, you can't learn languages in two weeks. It's, a, it's an entire lifetime's journey uh, in that sense into le learning languages. But you understand the structure of language after a period of time, so you understand how to, and that helps, and that help, helped again in how to do it in Scandinavia. So I like speaking other languages. It's just really, uh, you know, that's a real added bonus for me. Um, and this thing about learning and keeping to learn, keep learning, and keep listening is so important throughout your career. You, you don't want to stop. You've got to be open all the time to the influences of others, to listen to others. And you pick up uh, and you mould that information to, to, to adapt your own thinking. As I said a bit earlier that having a mentor helps. I had a guy called John Atkinson who really helped me uh, tremendously. He taught me a lot. Uh, uh, and so that is always important. So if young people today can find somebody, spend a bit of time with them to advise them on the direction of travel. I know that you do a bit of mentoring yourself, Adam, but it's a really, it's a really beneficial thing. And you, you, you get as much out of it, I think, as the, the mentee that you're, that you're helping. I, I think on the mentoring point, David, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great kind of topic at the moment because I, I know Sue is are doing an awful lot more around coaching and mentoring within the business, but I've seen both the CIWM, Chartered Institute of Waste Management, and the International Solid Waste Association, ISWA, instigate quite extensive mentoring um, and coaching programs because they recognise that where you work and where you live may, may not have the opportunities around you because of the situation to give you the right type of mentor. And I think it's, it's been very interesting being involved with both those programs and, and with the series development that we're, we're now helping to match make, for want of a better word mentors and mentees so that you can get the right skills and the right attitudes so you get you know that fast tracking of the debate because i think i've had some terrible mentoring experiences over my years where there's just nothing in common and you know i'm looking at my mentee and my mentee's going who the hell are you and this is not working and i'm thinking well i'm not enjoying it either um so I, how you know I, I, are you actively mentoring anybody at the moment or or are you being mentored still well i'm not being mentored now um, but you can always keep learning, that is for sure. And I listen, listen, I read a lot, which is important, I think, to keep current with the information. I think I've gone past the coaching phase. <laughs> so I do give a bit of, you know, worldly wise advice now, which I would, I loosely term as mentoring. Okay. Uh, but but not, not in a sort of a formal one-to-one. -one. Um, carrying, carrying on the sort of thought process of what's important, you've got to work hard in life. If you want to get on, you've got to work hard. That sounds a bit, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a drudge or whatever. But, you know, people notice and your hierarchical uh, people notice the people that put the, uh, put the work in, have the right values, have the right ethics. You know, when I'm employing people i'm looking for people who are driven you can tell very quickly about the the driving people far more than you know the education uh, although an element is important it's the drive and enthusiasm of people that really shines through more than pure academia in my in my opinion and um, i think Sorry. Just, just on that, I, I know I'm going to keep interrupting you for the next hour, but it's, it's fascinating. How, how do people with drive and passion get in front of you to showcase that? Because I think 
I think a lot of people will be saying to me online at the moment, yeah, it's great. I've got to send a CV in. How the, how the hell do I show drive and passion in a two page document? I need to get in front of David Palmer Jones. You know, can I hijack him? Yeah, you can, bizarrely, because I am quite uh, open to being hijacked. I, um, I'll give you a good example of a, of a young student who lived in Maidenhead, where our office is. <clears throat> and she was doing geography. Do you know, I think you've done geography as well, I believe. Indeed. She was in coming, she finished her second year and she needed some work experience. And she wrote to me through LinkedIn and told uh, myself, told uh, me all about herself and what she wanted to do. And she really said, you can tell she had a bit of drive to do it. I bet she was a bit plucky to do that. And I thought, well, I mean, she could just come in, have a cup of coffee and we'll have a chat. And she, you know, she impressed me as a person. So I fixed her to be, to come for a few weeks to give her that bit of her experience because she asked and she acted in such a positive uh, manner that you think that a lot of uh, employers would give the time. And we, we certainly as always like to give the time to, to people that really show an interest in, uh, in what they're going to do. And I noticed she was one of the people and I read in the Sunday Times or whatever that she'd started the petition against, uh, you know, student fees in the last term. And I thought to myself, well, I wasn't so wrong there, was I? Because she was obviously quite driven and quite go ahead. So I, I, I think, she, you know, she'll do well in life because she, she, she dared ask the question. Sometimes people are concerned about asking the question. Now, not, uh, you know, sometimes people are very busy and can't answer all the time. But if something that resonates with you, I think you'll find that people do that. I, I think do from, react. My, from my experience, I, and, and I know I've seen you at conferences and events and post COVID, I'm sure we'll see you at conferences and events, but I've always warmed to that individual that either walks up to you, you know, at an event or asks you, you know, puts the hand up and asks you a really tricky question in, 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 a, in a platform or environment. And, and, and they're the people I remember. And, you know, when, when they send you an email three weeks later and say, could I come in for a for work experience? I'm, I'm always much more open to that and, that and always have been, I think, because that's that commitment and drive that is very hard to show on, on, on a simple CV. It, it is. And CVs are always difficult to because that's a bit of a bit more of a lottery. So, you know, be you know, be proactive, I think. Um, change is going to be fundamental in our industry and the change is just accelerating. So, you know, we have the famous saying in Suez, don't we, Adam, that the only constant is change. Indeed. So you've got to embrace change. You don't fight change, embrace it. And as part of your career, you're going to need to really do that uh, in order to, to move, move with the, you know, the, the strongest direction of travel. I think also you've got to have a very clear pathway in terms of your career. I think if you don't have a plan, you're not going to go very far. So I always am very clear what I'm trying to achieve throughout my career. And I know what my next step is and I know what to do next. And I'm just building uh, the building blocks and experience and knowledge in order for, to allow me to be able to, to make the changes I want to do as I develop through the career. So, be pretty, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, clear about what you want to achieve uh, in life. And that really gives you the framework to, to achieve. Uh, I think the last point I would say is you should work a little bit every week for yourself. And that's someone, I got a bit of advice from somebody many, many years ago to do that. And you think, well, that's pretty unfair to your employer, etc. Well, I don't think it is because it, it improves your value your own personal value, but also your value to your, your employer. So, you know, the same as having a career path, spend a little bit of time thinking about yourself. You're probably going to do enough hours for your employee for employer anyway. So make sure that you are also forming yourself in the right particular manner, which allows you to get to your, your aspirations, I think. Excellent advice, David. Thank you. So we've got passion, we've got openness, we've got learning, we've, we've got embracing change, and we've got creating time and space for you to develop. Interestingly, we've already had a comment back from, from somebody who said, David's always had time for people, uh, and I appreciate that, and he would always listen. I won't say who it's from, but I'll tell you afterwards, and he, he didn't work for you. So that's great to hear, isn't it, that you know, people have felt, felt that you're approachable and engageable, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's great feedback. Good, thank you. So let's move on. Let's over the last fifteen years or so, you've held held 
critical positions within the Environmental Services Association, looking after the waste and resource companies. You've been on the board at RAP. Um, you've been, you know, chairperson with FAAD across Europe, and then you've taken on the leadership of the UK Resources Council. So what's, what's been your motivation for these collaborative cross-party initiatives? Why, why, why have you been committing your time and, and, and Sue's effort into, into stuff that's more sectoral or even beyond the sector? Well, you want to make a difference. That's what it's about. You know, if you, if you can gain a, a position of uh, influence, then you can drive change. And that's really my uh, motivation. So I have a personal motivation. It's good that my personal motivation is in line with my employer's motivation, which is the environment. So that, that fits very nicely. And I'm very, you know, uh, blessed to have an employer who wants you to make a difference and allows the time for you to do this because it is a personal commitment as you know Adam with your work in CIWM etc so I think it's that personal motivation and commitment around circularity that was the cornerstone of when we started to change our business 11-12 years ago in the UK with our strategy around circularity but also you know my commitment to resource efficiency so it's personal motivation to influence change uh, and you know I can use my personal position my personal experience and knowledge to assist that change and to be always trying to push the debate and probably you can remember that it's only recently we have got to get on to that that uh, we had a listening partner in government I can remember 10 11 years ago I was a bit of a lone voice uh, and it was nice to be in uh, organizations like RAP who had similar, you know, uh, aspirations and thought processes as I did about where the future is going to lie. But we were a bit of a lone voice for a long period of time. I think the world's a bit of a different place now, though. So that's a, that's a real positive. But it was all about influencing and uh, raising the debate and then assisting now as we see as we shift to a more, you know, um, consultative and assist, uh, assisting type of uh, role that we are playing certainly as Suez in the, in the UK with the government. So are you feeling more positive about the legislative development space at the moment in the, yeah, in the UK? It, yeah, it's, it's funny because 10 years ago, as I said, we were drifting. We really did desperately rely on EU legislation. Without that, there was nothing. And I think we begrudgingly as a, as a nation followed that. Uh, and it's it's changed. And we suddenly had this, uh, you know, seminal moment, didn't we, when we talk about the stars aligning, where we had the Chinese uh, issue of China sword, etc., everything stopping, uh, you know, the, the underpinning sort of uh, uh, element of recycling in the UK was taken away. You had Blue Planet with David Attenborough, you know, absolutely lighting up switchboards across the BBC with people's anger around plastic in seas. And then suddenly through the, uh, you know, the quirk of fate through Brexit and falling out with Boris Johnson, he's probably not the only person who's fallen out with Boris Johnson at the moment, uh, is Michael Gow, who re reappears, reinvents himself as, a, as an eco-warrior and has the clout within government to suddenly push DEFRA into a completely different accelerated space and I see DEFRA blossom before our eyes <laughs> in sort of a biodiversity uh, way uh, and you see them really uh, pick up the mantle so we've got a bit of credibility in the UK now and I'm, I'm always fascinated to see how well we've done renewable energy we're not producing electricity through fossil fuel anymore and that was to do with you know some quite brave legislation and in fact environmental acts which pushed uh, it into legislation that would improve over a period of time and that's why it's so important to see and I know you're a great advocate as I was about enshrining some of the targets into law which prevents any form of party politics coming uh, and going into the future so we about two years ago we saw this change and we thought to ourselves well stop complaining David and Suez Let's get on the side of DEF and see if we can help them. And you remember we did, I don't know how many, I lose count of the number of workshops and assistance we did of, throughout, the, throughout the whole of the industry trying to, to change things. And they, uh, they came with a document <clears throat> that frankly could have been written by us uh, at the time. 
and so I think that really is uh, a wonderful uh, opportunity uh, for that particular change. Uh, I think you see now the preparation of that. We have the consultations which are ongoing. They've been a bit delayed because of COVID, like everything else has been, but I expect by the end of the year, we'll have a much greater clarity of where we're going. I think 2023 is going to be an amazing watershed for the UK, and they'll be pushing uh, into a couple of areas that I'm particularly passionate about, extended producer responsibility, PR as we we know it. And I remember talking about this at conferences two or three years ago and people looking at me like I would said something, a profan- you know, profanity or whatever. Uh, I think people realise that uh, that's a critical way of creating circularity and joining the dots, stopping all the issues of push and pull, demand and supply issues that have dogged uh, recycling uh, stability over the last number of years so I'm looking much forward to to what's going to happen there and remember we're talking about 100% of costs for EPR uh, and you know that will kick off this whole circularity from design onwards really placing not just with the producers but with the consumers giving voice to the consumer ability to consumer to influence and understand and link itself back to you know, the packaging, uh, the goods, etc., that they purchase and the impact that then has on the environment. So, yeah, big, big change. I'm glad that I kept complaining for 10 years. Uh, I think it's proved, proved to be right. We found the, we found the saviour in Michael Gove. Uh, and uh, I think you'll see us continue. I, I think it's moved from being, you know, a non-entity politically to absolutely centre stage. And... Uh, Clearly, COVID, yeah, COVID is also in, in influencing that. I think. Well, well I think I, th- I think COVID and, and the environment have become centre stage, stage. You know, not not just here in the UK, but but, but globally. And I just wonder, you know, with with your change of role in recent months, you know, group senior executive, bright vice president. It's a lot. It's a lot of words, isn't it? <laughs> for, for Northern Europe, that's the bit that I'm yeah. interested in. Um, how has COVID impacted on you? Because, you know, you, you went from an office in Maidenhead to, a, you know, a, a shed in the garden, you know, to, you know, all these offices around Europe that you were going to visit and, and, and engage with, you know, sort of change management. You've been stuck at home, haven't you? How, how's the role panning out? I did get a few, a few weeks in, <laughs> to be fair to me. It was only March. I mean, you know, the first instance we have was in Luxembourg, which we look after. I'm speaking to them this morning. And people were ringing me up saying we've got cases in Luxembourg and I was thinking this is very strange and it you know it turns out that Luxembourg was infected by the workers in France who come across from eastern France and eastern France was a hot spot in France where there was a, a festival there which caused I think uh, the outbreak and if you look at the cases in France it's Paris and that area Vosges and that sort of area close to the border but uh, so that was the first thing. Then it's into Belgium and then off we go and everybody knows, you know, what, what happened. Next, very interesting for me is because I look after such a big geography in Czech, Poland, Sweden, Germany, uh, Netherlands and Belgium, etc., France and the UK. They're all impacted in different ways, very much to do with the, the uh, infection rate in each individual country, but also the government approach. So those that were quite good, Germany have been less affected. Sweden have had a very different view. They've been less affected in terms of business. Yet you've had much greater impact in areas such as Belgium, uh, Netherlands, France and UK, where there was a decision to lock down society uh, for all the good reasons that you know. Uh, You have a brutal stop of uh, society and industry and commerce. And that affects clearly your business or parts of your business. What I've been super proud about, Adam, is that Throughout all of this, throughout the whole of Northern Europe, for all the services that were required from customers, so some customers weren't because they switched off, but for the domestic side, Suez has done 100% of services every single day throughout that period, not missing a beat. And that is, you know, an absolute testament to the brilliant people that we have who can adapt themselves, but also to the amazing guys on the shop floor who, you know, really... uh, are a credit to society, in my opinion, and for once begin to be recognised uh, for that. And this, you know, reconnection with our business and people clapping and applauding the bin, the bin guys is just fabulous. And we've got to build upon that. 
uh, you know, on top of that, you've got this sensitivity also, haven't you? You've got this renewed sensitivity about the environment. Yes. People, have, people have seen, we talk about birds singing, you know, in my garden. You know, people talked about birds singing in Paris. They never heard that because of traffic, because of pollution. They could see for miles. So there is a reawakening of, do we want to go back to the world that we left? And I'm not so sure. And I can see that a lot of the um, politicians in many of the countries now talk about a rebound, a reboot, a rebound, but not forgetting the green elements. And I think if you'd gone three or four years ago, I don't know if that would have been on the agenda. I think it's very, very sensitive now. We as a sector have to continue to to build upon this new legitimacy that we've found uh, and, and, and continue to demand support to, con to continue to move our environment forward. One of the, um, one of the uh, audience has just asked, you know, is our environment in a better condition now than it was perhaps five years ago? And, and, and I, would, I would ask you, and are you confident that that rebound is something that we can control so we don't just go back to the old norm and end up you know, with Paris and London being under, you know, constant smog, for example. <laughs> that will be down to political conviction. I think trouble is people forget, and I think as humans you're programmed to forget bad instances in order to continue. You put them in the back of your mind and, and we're all happy to be released from lockdown in order to continue our lives. Uh, I think this one has been such a, a brutal uh, situation that people won't forget, I don't think, too quickly. I think pol politicians will also be given the legitimacy to make some perhaps more difficult decisions because they see that it is important. They can see the impact it makes. It's very difficult to switch everything off and see like an experiment that, you know, the world was a better place. And you can see through just, you know, industrial production in China and you know, Italy and other places that greenhouse gas emissions dropped dramatically. Uh, and so, you know, I hope, and I think it's our job as well to keep on uh, badgering people to say that there is a different way to go. Let's make this rebound a green rebound uh, and let's put in, uh, and I saw that um, Europe uh, yesterday was talking about quite a lot of uh, legislation and packages associated with building up uh, a more environmentally friendly uh, approach and i think that's that'd be great if that happens good uh, a couple of questions coming in so let's let's pick a quick one for you how um what are your thoughts on the opportunities and challenges of our sector in emerging markets and that's outside of your remit i i fully understand but you're a you're a you're a wise head so tell us what east asia middle east you know africa are the challenges that they are facing going to be similar to ours or or do you think that the waste management situation is going to be very different well, you, 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 pick, you pick a bit of a span there, the world, and everybody has different starting points. I think that's always the important thing to know. And clearly, um, you know, in terms of uh, sustainability, number one is water and clean water always. And then after that, clearly it's sanitation. So you move from sanit sanitation to then into, into the reclaiming of uh, materials. Uh, uh, I think that uh, there are different speeds across the world for that. I think what the rest of the world needs to do is to learn. And I think we're pretty poor, as we've seen even in Europe, about not learning about mistakes made by others. Uh, and I can think of one or two different technologies that have failed miserably. Uh, and we continue to, <laughs> to proliferate them elsewhere. So if you're looking at that, it should be about water, and purity of water, control of wastewater, and then into our, our room, into sanitation in order to ensure that the technologies used are cost effective uh, and uh, allow an evolution over time. I think in countries where GDP is less, uh, wealth is less uh, important than perhaps Northern Europe where I work, and making sure that te technologies are relevant and not uh, overly costly. I've seen numerous um, bad examples of consultants selling in, you know, overly complicated systems, which are then, you know, fall over because they don't have the, the support locally. So take it step by step. And I would definitely go starting on looking after sanitation, but look after minimizing resource 
continue to reuse clearly you know there's an economic incentive and then recycling and recycling can be done in all sorts of formats including the info informal sector where you know with a bit of organization the informal sector could become quite powerful i know there's some brilliant uh, uh, examples of that in india etc where they really are um, spreading and developing wealth by a little bit of organization of uh, the informal sectors so i think that would be a great way to go and then as you move out of that as gdp uh, allows then you can absolutely uh, improve uh, improve performance uh, without hopefully continuing to you know uh, profligate with consumerism which the west has failed with over a period of time has only reconnected with itself recently so uh, don't waste uh, materials uh, think very carefully from the beginning and if you're starting from the starting point it perhaps allows you to to learn from others i i particularly like your uh, your take on you know let's use the hierarchy in the traditional sense with we need to push prevention uh, and and that sort of the reuse and, and and informal recycling because i think if anybody was to try and recreate what's happened in western europe that's a very long journey with a lot of more consumers wanting to be, you know, of American, British, Western Europe, whatever standards are, that's, that's a painful journey, I think, to go through. So yeah, maybe, maybe Adam, some business models as well would be a good thing, because look at consumer fashion, which is a, you know, fortunately I don't get involved with, but as you can see, but um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, things like that, that we don't talk about, uh, models of uh, swapping and all these different things that are, are possible, uh, that we've just accepted uh, waste uh, and you know that's an anathema to me and probably to you know post-war britain etc where they had no ability to to throw away uh, throw away clothes they didn't, or men, not mend clothes etc so i think there was lots of other business models like you know the servitization or the leasing or usage pay by usage uh, that, that, that would be a good way of introducing earlier not trying to reclaim you know back from a bad position yeah. so that's what i would advise so we've talked globally now let's bring it back to europe you know the space that you call home what are the big three challenges for waste and resource management within within europe over the next four to five years so you, you, you picked up just as you were talking there about the world but also within uh, europe and having been the president of fiat and trying to manage uh, a consensus of opinion at FIAD with 27 different countries and exercised all the patience that I probably don't have. <laughs> so that was a very interesting learning curve for me uh, personally to do that. And you end up a bit of compromise. So I realise now when looking at Brexit, etc., you understand why it's not very easy to do it. Yes. But there's vast differences in Europe. So you talk about the Belgian, the Dutch, the Swedish, maybe a uh, and then you look at Romania, etc., who are heavily dependent on landfilling still. Uh, there's still lots of issues around uh, illegality and illegality of, of different treatment methods. So speed is difficult, it's diff different. And so there is already a challenge in terms of uh, the present results and the aspirations that are contained within the circular economy package, which is a step ahead of the previous uh, sort of landfill directives talked about diversion from landfill etc we still haven't got there so my first element would be around regulations and aspirations to results so it's great this is what i like about the uk they're really backing it and they're backing it financially economically and with some clout you know plastic tax etc just writing a regulation and having a wonderful aspiration to uh, delivering results is a big uh, a big ask i think and i think there europe has its biggest uh, its biggest challenge uh, because it seems to me that they often allow um, you know uh, this slippage to continue and continue and continue because it's too difficult etc i think they do need to absolutely if they want the consistency of result and they would need to assist some of those uh, poorer pouring poorer uh, less well um, performing countries to do the right things and again i go back to my point about right technologies right approach minimization recycling first before you start 
overly building com complexity into the system. So that, that's a major challenge. Second would be behavioural challenge, because it's all right for the uh, politicians to say yes, but you've got to get the public to say, yes, I'm going to do it. And you know that famous rule that we have 90, 90, 90, 90% 90 of the people, 90% of the time doing 90% of the right things, equals about the level of aspiration. That's a huge ask, even in Belgium and Germany, et cetera, who've been doing it for the last 50 years, let alone people who are coming from a lower position. So getting that behavioral change, and then that's why I would start about the frugality, the, 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 the understanding uh, or, and, and association with uh, managing resources and the fact that it is actually a cost advantage for people to do that. I think the last one would be the growth of GDP because really often there's a, a value uh, element here that uh, you can afford more and more as your D GDP increases. So as wealth expands across the whole of the geography of uh, Europe, then that will assist in uh, absolutely being able to uh, put the right infrastructure on the ground, have the right systems of air collection, etc., in order to produce the results that all of us want. So Suez has huge R&D programs. You know, we've got R&D centers around the world and we invest in lots of startups and entrepreneurial activity, constantly looking at new technologies. Questions are already coming in about, you know, the future isn't landfill, the future isn't incineration or energy from waste. You know, are there any technologies on the horizon that you, you, you know, you nod and a wink to that we should be keeping an eye out for? Being an economist, I feel a bit of a fraud. Technical economy, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> because you can say all economists manage to get through that, talking about stuff they don't really understand or control. I would say that uh, you've got to be careful about progression. Just as I said, it's important in Asia, et cetera, other areas, Africa. It's just as important in uh, making sure that uh, the here and now is managed. People want to go to utopian positions immediately. And you and I visit our sites and see uh, what the public, even in the UK, uh, throw out or, or how they manage waste, can see that there is a journey. And what you've got to do is plan very carefully a transition from the here and now, which is reasonable in the UK, and development of energy plus uh, recycling, and now you know, with greater assistance on EPR, etc., through to this next phase, but you've got to do that and still manage the day-to-day. -day. So you've got to be uh, very careful not to forget and throw away the day-to-day, -day, hoping to get to ut utopia. Often that's when a lot of results, a lot of wasted resource and capital, which again is, in my view, a waste, is utilised. So look, think very carefully long-term of this successive step change. Add the layer of regulation which assists that change, but make sure that you're looking after the here and now. Uh, in terms of that. Uh, I think um, there will be quite a lot of self-sufficiency discussion coming on post-COVID because supply chains will shorten. People can see that, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket, which was China, is not a very clever thing to do. And therefore, we'll have to see how we can marry up uh, our own need for resources locally with our own industry and make sure that we are keeping a resource efficiency. And... Um, you know, if I dare do my technology bit now, I think it's this reformation, dare I use the slightly religious uh, name, reformation there, to reform, uh, I think is going to be the change. When that is, I, I can't give you uh, a precise date, but I think it is a good 10, 15 years in the future that we have to manage successively. And I think we'll move from you know, the, the use of electrons, so the projection of energy, saying that then to molecules. So the reformation of materials from their base form of different forms of material stream or waste through organic or chemical recycling, where we will then be able to uh, deconstruct and then reconstruct, reform, and uh, reformation, reform into products that will, could be whatever you wish to do plastic recycling and uh, chemical recycling will be a good example of that you break it down you break the chains down and then reform the chains into whatever form of plastic you have there therefore creating circularity rather than the loss through uh, material recycling or energy from waste at the moment 
even though those are still legitimate to deal with a day to day over a period of time. So that's what I would would answer. That's not a bad technological answer for an economist. So we'll let you have that one, David. I'm, I'm going to move us on because time time is flying. Questions are still flying as well. So. Recently, you were voted number one in the Resource Media Hot 100. I know that's a UK hot list. I'm sorry, everybody, but, you know, it's the only barometer we had available. In recent years, it was Mike Webster, CEO of Waste Aid. It was Cat Fletcher of Freegal. You know, these are people that are very bottom up. They're, they're you know, they're, they're in the trenches trying to make change. And, and suddenly, number one is, here we go, CEO of Suez in the UK. You know, you're big, you're global, you're brand. How, how does that feel? And, you know, and, and what's your reaction to that? Because it's, uh, it's, it's quite an accolade. Well, I mean, I know, I was, I've, was, I've was only ever surprised. made number 25, David. You know, I, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> I was both surprised and honoured <laughs> in equal measure, let me tell you. That was quite uh, uh, an amazing. I mean, as you say, you know, my heroes win this. So, you know, Kat Fletcher, I'm a great fan of. You know, all the work she's done with Freegal, etc. She's been advising. Suez. I got her to come and advise about Manchester, etc., on reuse, because of it, because she's so uh, talented in this area, and we learned so much from you know the the hard yards that they've done for many many years. So to be placed in a similar category of people like that is, is a very uh, special, uh, prestigious moment uh, for me. The second thing, a little bit more in terms of work, clearly, every year, once you're in the Hot 100, it's, it's it is it is a problem because. Everybody then judges you, your, your value from where you are the next year. And so clearly I had a lot of um, very supportive uh, colleagues, as you mentioned, uh, you know, a bit earlier, who tease me rotten and wait with bated breath to see where you appear to unleash an amount of uh, abuse upon me. Um, and therefore, when I was uh, I knew a day or so before, and I could, you know, sit quite smugly waiting for that particular moment, safe in the knowledge that they wouldn't attack me this particular, particular year. I mean, joking aside, I mean, what I think is, I hope it's a, a bit of a recognition for the, the long time and effort I've made over many, many years to, to, to bring the debate. Uh, you know, it's spent a lot of time, a lot of hours to, to do this, a lot of speeches, a lot of, you know, influencing, a lot of articles, a lot of talking to media to keep us, you know, in the eye of uh, the public and, uh, as importantly, the politicians. And so it's great to see that we, we found, as I've said, through COVID, this fantastic reconnection with our business. And at last, people really do see what, why, why we are important, not just the sanitation element of it, but... You know, they've, they've this reawakening of the sensitivity to the environment gives us a wonderful platform. And I shall keep on, keep on uh, pushing. Thank you. It's, uh, well, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a great accolade. I mean, it's, it's always great to see colleagues that you, you work with or used to work with on there. And, and I think it is a, a barometer of, of influence and effect. So um, it's well deserved, David. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll doth my cap if I had one okay. to you right now. I'm going to just jump back to some really good questions coming in. So is the pandemic COVID offering us an opportunity to really move towards low consumption styles of living or is this just a blip? I don't know. I think, I think clearly uh, we are cons cons consumption is perhaps behavioral. Uh, and you can see that you get into habit forming. Uh, I think, you know, uh, breaking habits uh, and that by breaking consumption, shopping, possibly will dampen for some considerable time. I think people will think twice. I think there's an economic effect which also will dampen for the next year, two years, uh, through the uh, uh, reduction in uh, economic um, activity. So I think that will have a bit of an effect. And people think twice now what's important in life. This is my phys <laughs> philosophical uh, point, is that perhaps they don't think it's as important to have the newest, shiniest, whatever. Because in fact, health and life is that much important. And you perhaps can spend your, your money or save your money on other things, much, much more important than trinkets or whatever it happens to be, or just consumables. So I think there will be in the back of people's mind, is it, is it really uh, of value? So it's a, a value uh, proposition, this, I think. I think uh, the lesson I've learned sitting here wearing you know the one shirt that i've worn 
you know, once in the last two weeks. And I've got to be honest, I'm still wearing shorts and flip flops because the weather's so nice. Yes. Uh, w w when we do return to a new norm, um, you know, I've already told the, the current CEO that it will be shorts and flip flops and, 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 and a good shirt if he's lucky. I don't need that wardrobe of suits that I used to, used to wear so often. Oh I, I, I think I'm adapting. <laughs> Um, right. So you've just talked about consumers and, and sort of economics. Let's, let's pick up another question. Good one from Derek Grady here, who sends his regards. Oh, hi, Derek. Um, <laughs> is EPR going to increase costs of, of products and packaging generally, um, both here and, and of course across Europe, because it's happening there as well? And, and if so, do you think the consumer, i.e. you, me and my mum, um, are we ready and willing to pay that additional price or will it have the, the desired behavioural change? I think... Uh... Derek is going to pick up that, yes, it will increase costs. And I'm going to say to Derek, good, because it's about time we pay for, you know, uh, the environmental impact that we have. And that's, that's dependent on the type of product you're talking about. When you're talking about packaging, and quite a lot of the effort early on, I think, in X and abuse responsibility will be around packaging. It is going to be a promil of cost that's added. So as a consumer, you won't particularly uh, see it. Um, I think um, Stuart and others have done a, an amount. Is it about 20 to 30 pounds a year, something like that? And goodness me, you know, I think most people would think if we can improve the environment of the, of the country you live in for that amount of money, which pays for, I don't know, a week of mobile phones, then I think, you know, we're, we're going to be able to, uh, to, to accept uh, that particular element. And it is also, you know, not to forget that the consumer will have some power. I hope that external producer responsibility will have some form of uh, uh, labeling associated with it. So we can actually reward even more the brands who really work hard to uh, reduce their modulated the, the fees associated with the impact that they make. So I think that is absolutely massively important. Also allows for an amount of influx of, of money into the marketplace, which is much needed for our local authorities. You know, to speak as a local authority officer, as you remember now, Many years ago, that um, uh, it's it's extremely important to make sure that we are have got the money in the system which allows investment, uh, standardisation of collection systems, all these things that will drive the quality and allow that circularity uh, uh, circularity to to uh, to start to come uh, forward. Changing design, there's there's a massive influence this will have, and it was really the bit that's been missing for me. It's the sort of silver bullet to make and connect uh, uh, this particular um, direction and change. So I'm, I'm very, very pro, as you can hear, to, uh, to, to see the impact of, of that. And we wait, for, you know, bated breath with the, the government to, to bring it forward. But no, I think it's, it's, it's well worth uh, the effort. You know, it's the same for the expansion of extended producer responsibility into mattresses, into tyres, into... You know, they've redone for Wii, they've you know, ripped up Wii and they're going to do it again because it didn't function. So it's a great opportunity to reboot some of those yep. elements. But, you know, why shouldn't there be a responsibility of the producer who put tyres into the marketplace to take them back and manage them and have them not dumped by the roadside? Uh, and we've seen a little bit of an influx of uh, fly tipping now. And you see how desperate the public sees that to be. It's even more evident now when we're not permanently on the move so absolutely reconnecting a true value of the impact through extended producer responsibility people will accept because they understand if it's managed well why we're doing it and the world let's face it will be a much better place by doing it good words david strong words thank you right two quick questions because i'm almost out of time um any particular qualifications that you would recommend? And I, I, I'm going to add to that question because, you know, you and I have worked quite a lot on the Resources Council UK resources sector agenda in the last 18 months. As we morph towards more circular economies and, the, you know, the centricity of resource management in, in our economy, what kind of skills are, are the next set of recruits going to need to be at the heart of that transition? It's, it's, uh, that's again, thanks, Stuart, for, uh, for, Stuart, for uh, Adam. I always make some, I'll be calling him my son. It's names, large. They, 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 yeah, that's such a difficult question to answer because our, our sector and industry is so broad. Yes. So, in there, you've got every conceivable discipline and uh, skill base you need. So, you can break it perhaps down into different elements from the commercial side of the business. 
through to the, the technical side of the business and even support parts of the business. So I think you've got to look at the specific, go back to my original advice, what you're passionate about, the area that you feel that you really want to be involved in. I can assure you that in our sector, the skills that you're going to have from chemical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, economics, marketing, sales, through to accountancy, all the different elements will be needed within our industry. So don't think so much about uh, the one qualification, which means that you can enter the uh, resource, resources uh, sector. Look at what you're good at, what you're passionate about. And absolutely, there are uh, places associated with that. And clearly, as a geographer and an economist, you know, it wasn't that specialism that particularly drove us to our, our positions today. It's more the passion we have to, to get involved and learn and listen and, and, and develop and read and, and get involved. That's far more important. And back to that point about drive, really, you know, have that drive. It's seen by employers, uh, employers I can assure you. Excellent advice. So my final question from the audience um, is about you reading a lot and what would you point some people at as good, good reference documents or, or a great read that's going to give them a bit of a driver and insight. And I'm looking at your shelf, David, and I'm seeing a book by Alex Ferguson on leadership. Is that a good starting place? <laughs> well, no, because <laughs> I, have a, I have an issue with Alex Ferguson about succession. And he failed miserably on succession where he might be good in terms of engagement, et cetera, and managing, uh, you know, difficult stars. Which I, I, you know, that's probably why I read it, too, how to deal with Stuart and yourself. <laughs> that's why I was reading it, really, to so manage difficult stars. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that there's one particular book. There is a vast range of books within our particular space. I think you have to, you know, always be current. So I'm always trying to read the latest thinking. And on top of that, I read massively newspapers. So my joy of the day is starting at six o'clock in the morning reading, reading the newspaper. So I get a bit extra now because I don't have to go to work. I can go up the garden instead. Uh, so I'd absolutely be current. Look at all the wonderful magazines within our sector, which have fantastic, um, which is what I read. I just got the CIWM through the door. Circular Magazine, there are a lot of other ones uh, in, uh, that, 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 that carry an absolute body of super short articles by absolutely top people who are talking about current elements. And that, I think, you get that blend between that, bit of local, a bit of, bit of news, because that keeps you current, and then perhaps with some of the tones that you probably could assist upon, within our sort of environmental space. And there are quite a lot of those. That would be a good mix, I think. Very good, very good advice. Hopefully that answers uh, that individual question. So finally, if you're on a desert island and you're only allowed to take three records, CDs, whatever, you know, your, your media of choices, what would they be and why? Right. This is a terribly difficult question. So when I was growing up, my sort of pomp, as you would say, in terms of listening to music, would be probably 1977 to 1984, would be my specialist subject. Okay, very and so in there you've got punk and new wave and all those frightening uh, change from sort of the bland discotheque of the 70s through to this you know, quite, quite aggressive uh, music. Uh, and so I wouldn't mind a compilation of that era if I'm allowed to choose it. There probably is one. Best off 1977 to 1984. I'll, I'll look one. it up for you. That's because it came from my uh, from my era of when I listen. Unfortunately, as you get old, you listen to what you like to listen. So I infect my children who quite like the undertones and various other things now, which I'm very pleased to see. I think I would have something for the evening as well, maybe a bit of jazz. Quite like a bit of jazz. So that would be quite good. It's a mellow jazz. Then I think I would have, and um, the last one would be. Um, uh, probably a, a blend between self-help and practical skills and so I wouldn't mind a bit of self-help to keep the spirits up so I understand why I'm going mental on the island on my own which I'm able to focus my mind to keep me going. Nobody to rest. boss around that's, that's the problem David. <laughs> yes that's, that's a disaster I've got no one to uh, delegate things to <laughs> I do now uh, and also a bit of practical help about how to build shelters and things like that, because 
as I say, I'm not the world's most practical, even though I try quite hard, I'm not the world's most practical. So a bit of help on that might be quite smart to keep me alive, get me back to society, to keep going to influence, you know, a better world. That would be uh, that's what I'd do. I, I, I love the pragmatism, David. So tell me, um, final question, what next for Mr. David Palmer Jones? Well, that's good because it's sort of uh, also a difficult one. So I've got plenty to do, Adam. So 2020 is, is extremely, not just COVID, I've got a lot of things to do in terms of reshaping Northern Europe in, in, in line with the group's aspirations. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, going forward, I still would like to get involved in um, helping shape Britain and the world, etc. So being able to play a bigger role in the rollout of EPR would be something that would interest me because it's a huge challenge, quite a complex challenge uh, to do uh, practically, operationally, uh, uh, and in terms of, you know, circulating that money to best effect to get that circularity over the next period of time. So that would be a cool thing to, to have a go at. Sounds exciting. Um, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all of the audience who've been sending in some great questions. They were much better than the ones that I had prepared. So hopefully that kept, kept David on his toes. Um, if, 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 look, I, I've only worked for you for what, almost three years and, and, and I've, I've learned plenty and I bet everybody on the calls actually learned something. Even Stuart is probably going, oh, I didn't know that about David. He likes jazz. Um, what, yeah. what, what I've learned is that, you know, passion will get you a long way. Take a few risks. Um, you know, always be open to learning. Uh, don't believe everything that Alex Ferguson suggests uh, and work hard will get you a long way. But you must have a plan. And I like the fact that you've still got a plan, David, and there's still a future out there and you've still got things you want to achieve. So that's fantastic. What I also learned was that you and I had far more things in common than I could have ever guessed because we both love football. We're both second generation local government waste managers, albeit we defected at some point in our careers. Um, it's just a shame that you and I do like rugby, but you like wasps and I like Northampton Saints, but we can't have everything, can we? <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's not often I get to host my boss or b boss of boss or my former boss and, and have a, 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 a kind of warts and all conversation about the future and what's been going on and learn a bit about your history and what makes you tick. I hope the, the audience have learned a thing or two and have got a few pointers and I'm sure they could find you once lockdown is over and at an event and, and come and pester you about next steps in their career. I'm sure you won't turn them away, will you? No, not at all. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Sweater, thank you for hosting as always. It's been fantastic. I've been Dr. Adam Reed. He's been Mr. David Palmer Jones. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Adam. Thank you, David. Uh, it was really great to listen to uh, an entire career in uh, and to listen to the stories from the entire span of the career. And thank you. Congratulations on your first <laughs> webinar, too. So, all right. Thanks a lot, Adam. It was, as usual, fun. And you kept it engaging and you ensured that all the questions were answered. Thanks a lot to all the attendees. Just a reminder to all of you that next week we have two panels, uh, both of which you can register to. They're open, they're free for registration. Please head to our website and you will find them in the event section. And uh, have a good day in whichever part of the world you're in, you're in right now. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.